všichni po té platformě, ale buď někdy i tak to představí ráča, ale to potom oni tě robí, a já mám tak to mohu, a já tak to mohu, to mohu výbaví, a i šlo to poměrně rýchlo. Baňská šťavnica. Especially in May, it is a truly magical place. And that's one of the reasons why we decided, kinda officially, that should be our last stop on the May part of our big Slovak adventure. So from here, we're kinda going straight back home, which is not exactly true, because turns out there are many other places worth visiting around Bańska Szczawnica. So officially, this is the last stop. In reality, we are going to still visit two more spots. As I mentioned in the previous episode, there was this union of seven mining towns. So we are going to visit two more. And in the first one, unfortunately, the weather did not exactly accompany us. Welcome to another little town, um, somewhere deep in the mountains. But as you can see behind me, there is uh, a bit of fortification, so it must have been an important place. And um, it still kind of is, actually. It's a good example of how quality rules over quantity. It may be small, but welcome to Golden Kremnica. So let's enter, let's go towards the old town through the main gate and actually a defensive system we could call a barbecue, which is pretty cool, but of course for us right now something more important. Is it actually a mining town or not? Well, here they leave no doubts about it. And mind you, the place is ready to defend itself. There is a medieval cat still keeping watch over the town. Fantastic. Well, let's continue then. Let's enter. Actually, from the very first uh, moment, we are entering the main market square. And that's pretty much it. You have the main square nice and green which is awesome and then you have um, some buildings around then you have the main church on the other side and this is it Kremnica is really a small town and you can perfectly see it here so we entered right bottom corner in the barbican left top corner is the church we saw so let's go there now as i fear a lot of things including heights i am not going up the tower here but vicky did so here are the views. As you can see, Kremnica, the modern one, hasn't really outgrown the old one either. It is indeed, till the very day, a small town. But first things first, here we have, again, a fortified hill with a church. Although, unlike in Banska Stavnica, this is still a church. It was not converted into a castle. Anyway, that was the nucleus of protecting the town of Kremnica. And once again, you are going to see the old town and how small it really is. So you've got the green square, the buildings around you, fantastic. Now the city as such was born in the year 1328 by the charter of the King Charles Robert of Anjou. And from the very beginning, they also established here a very important institution. They found plenty of gold around Kremnica. So in the complex of buildings you are going to see in a second, they established the Royal Mint. So now let's magically go to the museum of the city and I guess after the Bańska Szczawnica comes as no surprise, under the city you are going to have plenty of medieval shafts and one of them you can visit in the city museum of course. And maybe when you hover around the mines you are going to find a miner and a crazy one at that. Not only one, you can actually find them in couples. And not only looking rather silly, but also, uh, I have to say, working very hard at mining. Now, the museum itself is modern, interactive, there are plenty of uh, interesting charts and tables and plenty of information, but it, in the end, the most important piece is the gold. So, for example, already 14th century, 140 kilo per year, that's more than 11 tons of gold in a century. And if you'd like more statistics, well, here they are. Look at the 17th century, actually not much, and then 18th century, again, a lot of gold. Maybe that's the influence of the mining academy in Banska Szczawnica. Kremnica is proud to be the first place already in the Renaissance using something we could call railway. But in the end, it's about something else. If there's gold and there's a mint, this museum is, I'm sorry to say, 
a wet dream come true of every numismat. And it's not only about coins, you already have here what more than 2000 years ago was used as money, made of uh, iron. But then the coins, the coins, the coins, everywhere all the time, from the Celtic uh, examples, very often based on coins minted by Alexander the Great himself, through, of course, plenty of Roman coins, which you can find pretty much everywhere, outside the Roman Empire as well. And then you're gonna have coins from the Byzantine times, and even coins from the so-called migration period in the early Middle Ages. But eventually, you are also going to have coins from the young Hungarian kingdom from a thousand years ago. But since 14th century, they are minted in Kremnica, mostly of gold, the so-called uh, Ducat. And of course, there was silver, so they were minting silver coins as well. But it is the Kremnica Ducat, which becomes in Central Europe, kind of a dollar of today. They were not cheating on the amount of gold in the coin, so it became metaphorically and literally the golden standard of uh, coins here. Besides that, special coins for special occasions were minted as well. We could call them medals today. And here, for example, at the top, 1508, the oldest such coin that we have from Kremnica. A number of examples here as well. So with all that importance comes also a very fancy symbol of the mint itself. Plus, it also kept on minting medals in the modern times. Such imagery after episode number 14 should come as no surprise. But what is surprising, there's actually modern art minted here as well. Plus, the modern Slovak state orders. They're actually thinking of a new one as well. And here is the very fancy design. Let's see what happens in the future. In the meantime, though, of course, they keep on minting coins. So in the 90s, they would mint the Slovak crowns. But now Slovakia is in the Eurozone. So the Slovak Euro is also minted here. So why am I telling you about all this? In the end, for one simple reason. The Kremnica mint is the oldest in the world continuously working mint. 700 years. For example, the Golden Ducats alone, they minted 21 million of them, amounting to today's $3 billion, and that's excluding numismatical value. They keep working not only for Slovakia, but for 25 different countries, including such exotic places like Sri Lanka. So, in Europa Universalis, the mint is the third Slovak national idea. So again, an amazing place hidden in the mountains of central Slovakia. But that actually was not the highlight. Here you have a really fancy plague column and a little tower in the background. That's part of the Franciscan monastery, who were actually brought here in the 17th century by Archbishop Pazmani, who appeared for a moment in the 13th episode. The place is in ruin, but there was kind of a guard there, and he actually decided to take us for a little guided tour. So it is in ruins, but they are actually renovating it. There's quite a lot of things going on um, there, and they want to open a fancy hotel and a cultural center and so on and so forth. And there's qu still quite a lot of work to be done. But actually, it's not a long way away that the place was completely fine. What you see, it's actually time of communism. So here we have a refectory. You can still see plenty of colors around you, but the wall on the other side used to look like this before Second World War. So there was plenty of life here not a long time ago. Here's an example of how it used to look like and how hopefully it will look like in the future but in case you're wondering what the monks were doing there, well, let me tell you, they were not only spending their time on prayer, as you can see. But actually, when it comes to monasteries, very often the most interesting part is not on the main level of today. It's in the, um, in the basement. And actually, very often those basements are not even basements. We have to keep in mind that for hundreds of years in many cities the level would rise so what you see today as a basement it wasn't necessarily so several hundred years ago but of course there were actual basements and for example the kitchens would be there and here's a, an example of a chimney but also for hundreds of years it was completely normal that the monks would be buried in a part of the basement in the catacombs so now you are not going to see a lot and that's the point let's go dark let's go mystical and let's find the catacombs themselves and actually we are going to find them 
and again they are going to be unfortunately vandalized completely. And it is again the legacy of the communist times. So not only was the monastery destroyed in terms of architecture, but actually many of the tombs here were literally sacked. But not 100%, you can actually still find bones. So it is rather creepy on the one hand and on the other it's actually kind of sad. You will also find some toys because it wasn't only a place where the monks were buried but also mm, orphans from the city and that's in memory of the fact. Mind you, even before the war it used to look like this. So it's actually a pity it is in a state that we find it today. But enough of the tour. I would like to thank our tour guide very much for his time and yet that was still not the highlight. The highlight was right next to the monastery. There was a little gallery of illustrations and it's a very interesting thing. We, when we think of art, we think of painting, maybe of uh, sculpture, but illustrations in books are also art and they're actually important because they make the books more interesting. They help us to visualize what we're reading about. And of course the cover uh, of a book if it's cool it will draw you to actually uh, pick the book up from a shelf right but nobody really including the artists themselves nobody really takes it seriously fortunately totoye galeria took it very seriously so what you have here is an exhibition of illustrations from many slovak authors including here's my personal favorite coming illustration to vine tu I was raised on the book by a German author, Karl May. It used to be very popular, not only for covers, also for beer stands. Here's Brotherhood Born from the First Gulp. Of course, Janosik had to be here as well. So what else could we get as a souvenir from Kremnica? A golden Ducat with Janosik for luck. Check them out. I am going to leave in the description a link to Totoje Galeria, our highlight of Kremnica. But of course, before we go, two honorable mentions. There was a little torture chamber. It's always cool to visit one, especially if they do have an um, executioner sword. And unfortunately, when it comes to synagogues, only such a photo is left. <coughs> but we are going to continue moving with better weather. Fortunately, let's visit another old mining town. Let's go to Pańska Pistrica. Of the seven medieval mining towns, definitely the biggest today, roughly 70,000 people, and you can see it, as in, there are actually people in the market square. But here let's do it differently than in Kremnica. Let's start with honorable mentions and um, unexpected highlights. So first of all, let's jump straight into the city museum, because, well, it is a typical museum, but it does have a couple of uh, little bits and pieces. For example, an executioner's sword with three little holes. Nobody really knows what it's all about. Main theory says those holes would make a particular sound when the mm, sword is falling, so the muscles get tense automatically, which is much easier to cut, which is important for both the executioner and the executed. And here also you have symbols of the makers, so very interesting details, but the highlight of the museum were the tiles, not only because they're very artistic, but because they were soap opera. Here, you've got wife beating husband. And on the next tile, well, I think they get along fine after all. So this is Bańska Bystrica 1500. Also, we found some modern art. We found Sorella, but the highlight of the communist times was in the main train station. Very nice stained glass windows. Here you have on both sides, both Bańskas, Stavnica in Bystrica. And I know they're pure propaganda, but artistically speaking, pretty awesome, I have to say. But our artistic highlight was Dominik Skutecki. In the building where he lived for 30 years until his death is today art gallery, of course, of his art. Now, he himself wasn't from Bańska Bystrica, his wife was. So he moved here when he was 40 and kind of an accomplished artist already. He studied in Vienna, in Venice. And by the way, Vicky saw it instantly through his style. She does have a good eye for art. So when he came to Bańska Bystrica, he was already kind of famous. But it is here, 1889, when he arrived, that he painted his highlight. A day 
in the market square of Bańska Bystrica. And that's what it is, a day in the main market square. Now the girl that's in the middle of the painting, she is the daughter of the architect of the house where we are in right now. She was painted in a scarf and that's the scarf at the top of the photo. It became a family relic. Now the kids here are the three kids of Skutecki himself. The one in the front in red is the oldest of the three. She became with time an accomplished artist and here we had her uh, painting and the kids were very often in Skutecki's paintings. He himself also uh, appears, plus very important people of the time. But he was mostly known in Banska Bystrica for basically painting the reality of life at the time. And here comes my favorite, Gypsy Woman. So Mr. Skutecki is going to come back later, but the best proof of his importance to the city, he has the most important painting as a um, wall of a shopping gallery. But let's go to history. 1255 officially the city is born as again a free royal mining town so we are now in a typical complex there should be a wall around us which didn't survive with the church curious detail it's not on a hill it's pretty much in the very middle uh, of the city but the city itself again was very small and again you can perfectly see it on the maquette in the middle is the church and it's basically one long street in a moment we are going to walk down uh, the main street, but first, in what's left of the fortification system, there is another museum, called Fugger Turso Museum. Unlike the city one, uh, which was cool, but old school, this one is very modern, 21st century, full on, you have here the talking heads. Those two guys are nice, but not important at the moment. At the moment, the other two are important. They gave the name to the museum. Welcome to... Jan Turso and Jacob Fugger. About them in a second more. Now let's say goodbye to the medieval gentleman and let the Celt eat his uh, lunch. Let's walk down the main street of Bańska Bystrica and let me introduce Jacob Fugger first. He was from a family from Augsburg in today's Germany. His father already uh, made the family kind of wealthy and important. Now, Jacob himself was um, learning banking and finances in Venice and also he was learning uh, goldsmithing. So he understood one very important thing. It's not only gold or silver that can bring a lot of money. It's also in the copper. We don't think of it as an important thing, but copper is basically plastics for hundreds of years until the very day when you, for example, look at um, look at roofs of churches. Very often what you see is copper exactly till the very day. So he understood how important it is. He was very smart, became a banker, started lending money to people owning uh, mines in Tyrol in Austria. As the loans have a very high percent, they cannot pay it in the end all the Austrian silver copper mines are in the hands of Jacob Fugger. But he understands he does have competition nearby. In Kingdom of Hungary, in today's central Slovakia, there are mines with plenty of copper and silver as well. And because we are talking about late 15th century, it's still Jagiellons on the Hungarian throne. Jagiellons were basically rivals of Habsburgs. Fugger understands he himself cannot become owner of those mines here but maybe he can work with somebody else. And here comes Jan Turso. He was a Hungarian aristocrat. He was famous for one thing. He invented a way to separate silver and copper that was easy, efficient, and both silver and copper maintained high quality, high purity. So they, late 15th century, form an enterprise. They form Ungarischer Handel, which we can call the first proto-capitalist kind of a modern enterprise. So, for example, Fugger started doing something which is today normal, double entry bookkeeping, at the time revolutionary. Also, every four years from the center in Augsburg, he would send um, control to all the centers to check if the books are right. They start investing in uh, logistics. They actually start building kind of modern roads, uh, you can say. Now, Turso himself also was uh, not only a Hungarian aristocrat, he was a member of Kraków. They had access to Kingdom of Poland. 
um, because Fugger used to uh, learn in Venice, they have access to Venice, they have access to Germany, so they start also building uh, little, um, let's say, offices everywhere. So they don't only have people working there in bookkeeping, not only in selling, buying, but also spies. They needed good connections among politicians. But maybe most important thing that they started doing is they started kind of creating little towns for their industry. Wherever they built a smelter or anything that would deal especially with copper to make some products out of it, they would also build a little town with all the basic necessities. So the people who work in the smelters, in the mines, they have also food and all the basic necessities provided from people living around. And one such place was established near Bańska Bystrica, Medeny Hamor, so literally copper hammer. And back in the Fugger Turso Museum, Vicky is using virtual reality to walk around the place. And as you can see, it uh, looks kind of cool and fancy, but also um, she is having a bit of a tough time, so as much as the idea is pretty cool, I'm afraid it may need some, uh, some more work. But we decided to go to the very spot itself, unfortunately that's how it looks like today. Uh, rather ruined, but even a hundred years ago there was still quite a lot going on, so our Dominik Skutecki comes back with more art. He would paint uh, people working and this is pretty much how it would look like even a hundred years ago Supposedly now they want to renovate it. They want to turn it uh, turn it into a cultural center But as you can see plenty of work to be done Although there are already concerts in the surroundings. So let's see what happens in the future But going back to the main streets Let's also talk a bit about the miners as here's another very important thing that Ungarischer Handel did Beginning of the 16th century, only around Pańska Bystrica, they had a thousand miners who were paid in cash according to uh, deals struck with them and also they were provided with something we would call today social and healthcare. So things that we kind of consider today normal, at the time that was revolutionary. So if you take all of that together, I guess comes as no surprise 16th century, at the beginning of the century, Ungarische Handel has a complete monopoly, especially on copper. Jacob Fugger was called the rich, and actually the Fuggers remained for a good 100 years one of the most important influential families in Europe, and uh, I guess we can say in the world. They, for example, financed Magellan and his, um, and his voyage around the world. But when it comes to the company itself, let's leave Bańska Bystrica again and let's go to Spania Dolina, a little um, mining village north of Bańska Bystrica, one of those places where copper uh, would be mined for hundreds of years and the best example of how much they mined, the hill you're seeing in the background is not natural. It's all the rocks that were taken out of mines while mining. Today it is mostly known for being very well situated in the mountains, very picturesque, but for us it is something else. It is the symbol of the fall of Ungarischer Handel. 1525, two things happened. Jacob Fugger died. He was a workaholic, so in his life he has a very strong hand over everything. But then the sons of his brother take over, they are neither that talented nor hardworking things start slipping out of their hands. Plus, the rulers started devaluing coin, which was actually a frequent thing for hundreds of years. What would happen is, you've got coins with plenty of silver, after several years those coins are taken back by the ruler, a new coin is released with way less silver. So for the um, royal treasury, that's perfect, silver is kept in the treasury. For the people, imagine the inflation. So the miners are paid in coin, as I mentioned. For them is a catastrophe. So 1525, there is an uprising in central Slovakia, in Spania Dolina as well. It lasted for a year. And for example, they actually burned the castle. And here you have it in the background in Bańska Bystrica. It didn't end well for them. As you can see here, 
but I guess we can call that uprising the first modern worker strike. And in Spania Dolina you have a monument to the victims of the uprising. Now look at the names, you will find Slovak, German and a Hungarian name here and there. So we've got the multiculti even among the miners. We're gonna come back to that, but just one extra detail. The company still exists, but it's more vegetating than anything else. 1546, officially, it went bankrupt. But the legacy of Ungarischer Handel we have everywhere. Mining legacy, well, Spania Dolina, first of all, is a very nice place to just unwind today. Architectural, here's the center of operations of the company, a very beautiful, fancy building. But even you're gonna find legacy far, far away. At the coast of Namibia, they found the Portuguese wreck with 22 tons of copper discs from Bańska Bystrica. And even a side effect of uh, copper mining, they would get pigments out that enabled Renaissance artists to paint with new colors. So you will find legacy of Ungarischer Handel and copper from Bańska Bystrica in many places, sometimes very unexpected. Yet again, an amazing story behind the mining culture. But for me, Bańska Bystrica holds one more very important person who actually only lived here for six years, but left such a mark that the local university is named after him, Maciej Bell. He was pretty much everything. He was a priest, a writer, historian, geographer, even alchemist. In the end, the most important person in the times of enlightenment in Hungarian kingdom. And mind you, he already appeared in the introduction. And I said, quoting him, lingua slavus, nazione ungarus, eruditione germanus. Time to explain what it's all about. Well, the first part is easy lingua slavus, so Slovak was his native language, he would speak Slovak at home. Nazione Ungarus. He actually doesn't mean Hungarian national, he means citizen of Hungarian kingdom. But the most difficult one, Eruditione Germanus, educated as German, most probably that meant his religion. He was evangelical. Mind you, Luther himself was German and the German patricians were not very receptive of counter-reformation. So most probably when he says Germanus, he means evangelical. And this is a great example of how people would self-identify before the modern times, before nationalisms. It wasn't exclusive. If you ask Maciej Bell whether he is Slovak, Hungarian, German, most probably he would not understand the question. He was all of those three things at the same time. People before the modern nationalisms would have several different layers of identity and it's very important to keep that in mind. And for me, Maciej Bell is a great example of what Slovakia used to be for hundreds of years. And if that's not enough of Multikulti, there's one more very important group to be added. The building you're seeing is the Uprising Museum and yes, we were here in episode 6. So today, instead of visiting a synagogue, let's go to a little garden next to the museum. And it is in memory of, uh, for a long time, forgotten hero of the uprising, Haviva Reik. Actually born in southern Slovakia 1914 as uh, Marta Reik, but she moved to Bańska Bystrica as a child, and here she joins um, the Jewish organizations, especially as she becomes a hardcore Zionist. So she was, for example, member of the um, of the Jewish Scouts. Then Czechoslovakia starts falling apart. It is 39. She emigrated to Palestine and joined one of the kibbutz movements. And also she joined the underground Jewish military. But because Palestine is still under the British mandate, in 44, when she heard of the Slovak national uprising, she asked the Brits, when they're flying over Slovakia providing help, that she would jump with a parachute. And that's exactly what happened. 17 September, she landed in Bańska Bystrica. She started organizing all the dispersed Jews who would very often escape from camps into uh, fighters. And those who cannot fight, she would try to smuggle them out of Slovakia. She would also join some of the groups of the resistance attacking prisons to free pilots uh, who got shot down over Slo Slovakia providing help. So for a month, that's what's happening. But late October, she got caught in a forest close to Bańska Bystrica, arrested, and then in November, she is executed in Kremnička, another victim of this unhappy place. 
Now all the names that you were seeing in the garden are the Jewish victims of the Holocaust from Bańska Bystrica and around, and many of them were also killed in Kremniczka, hence at the monument you will also have the Jewish menorah. And what an episode again, but once again, how can it be different? If you have such a little spot, three little cities, and you have the oldest technical university, the oldest continuously working mint, and the oldest in Europe modern commercial enterprise. It's all in central Slovakia. But I don't want to um, end this historically. I would like to finish it with good taste. Blink, blink. I have to say, Bańska Bystrica has one more very important thing. When you drink Slovak beer like Keld or Smetny Mnich, it's not Slovak. It's in the hands of the big brands like Heineken and Carlsberg. Only in Bańska Bystrica do you have Urpiner, the only commercial brand still in Slovak hands. Thank you very much, Bańska Bystrica. We did enjoy. And with that nice little image, it is time to end the May part of the big Slovak adventure. But don't worry, there is still late August and Eastern Slovakia is waiting. So prepare for more castles, for more awesome little towns, prepare for wooden churches and more multiculti coming. Finally, we are going to have more wine and finally we are going to have mountains and even on top of that, some awesome local music. So don't go anywhere yet, stay with me for a little extra while. But for now, thank you very much and see you soon.